Hello everyone, a commentary video for Plato's Sophist popped up in my feed a few days ago, so I decided to give it a listen. I won't say who made it, but I didn't agree with the conclusions at all, so I listened to another one. Again, it had conclusions I didn't agree with. So here we are, listening to me give my own views on the Sophist. I flicked through the dialogue this morning, took care of whatever I needed to do today, and finally found some time to sit down, have a few drinks, and write out this quick little monologue. As usual, it's one long take, so bear with me. As you might suspect, the dialogue spends much of its time explaining the term sophist. Of greater interest is the fact that the main speaker is a philosopher from Elea, and in giving an account of the term sophist, he demonstrates a particular method of divvying up what is, of identifying where the sophists lie within the greater whole, the dialogue is also famous because of an ontological discussion, which both shows Plato's deviousness as a fan fiction author, but also gives us an important observation about Eleatic thought prior to his effort to corrupt it in this dialogue. I actually remember the first time the sophist really stood out to me. It was 2010, and I was taking a bus down Michigan Avenue in Chicago on my way home from work. I specifically remember being impressed when the dialogue examined the term is not and rendered it in an affirmative manner, is other than. Of course, Plato goes off the rails after that, but whatever. I want to hit three main points in the recording. Uh, first is about the Eleatic philosopher, the main speaker. I don't think that the surviving 4th century Athenian works are particularly helpful for understanding the Eleatics. And I could say plenty of rude things about Plato and Aristotle on this point. But sometimes the dialogues give us interesting information, whether intentionally or otherwise. Here's what I took away. Here's something to consider from it. It appears that Eleatic philosophers were active in Athens, or at least the general Hellenic world, throughout the 4th century. There may have even been rival schools, because people like Plato talk about the followers of Parmenides and the followers of Melissus, as being related but distinguishable. We also know that the Eleatics not only heavily influenced Plato and others in Athens, but also seem to have had their champions in Megara and beyond. My pet theory is that Diodorus Cronus should be regarded as an Eleatic, but that's for another time. Point is, Eleatics were active throughout the Hellenic world in the 4th century, and Plato was apparently familiar with them. Uh, both with adherents of Parmenides and Melissus, uh, relating them, but apparently he identified some distinctions, uh, whether they were rival schools or not. To me, as someone who appreciates the Eleatics, this makes the sophist a little more valuable, because it shows an Eleatic philosopher demonstrating a particular way of describing reality. And maybe Plato had first-hand account, uh, first-hand experience of them using this method. If that's truly what Eleatic philosophers were doing in the 4th century, uh, I think it reveals something of how we should understand their metaphysics. And indeed, in my own work, I present a similar method of describing what is. So I think it, it, this dialogue may actually be a helpful uh, bit of information, assuming Plato had actually seen an Eleatic philosopher act this way. Uh, and I think it really takes us beyond those people who claim that Eleatics simply saw the the reality as illusions or some other nonsense. I mention anyway because it is interesting to anyone who likes Eleatic philosophy and also because it feeds directly into the next point, which is the first of two things I found disagreeable in the commentaries that wound up in my YouTube feed. Specifically, the commentators complained that the method of defining the term sophist, as performed in this dialogue, is arbitrary and silly. The commentators did not really put much meat on the bones of this objection, but here's my immediate response. The method is not arbitrary or silly. It is revealing the sophist by carving away that which is distinct from him. The speaker has perceived something. He's taken the sophist as his focus. Now he has to help the listener see it. That means identifying the distinctions that make the sophist special and somehow using them to capture the meaning he wants to convey. It's okay to talk about hunting, and then hunting of man, then hunting of man as prey, and for money, and so on. 
because he is taking the broad region of being where the sophist dwells or the sophist's art is described or dwells, and then slowly narrows it down in particular ways until we have a very specific and clear view of it. This method makes the sophist stand out to us, or at least in this instance, when we're talking about hunting, it makes his practice stand out to us. We might disagree that this starting point is the best or most efficient, or question whether he makes the right conclusions while carving across the distinctions, but the general method is good. With sufficient effort, we can be led to see what the Eleatic philosopher has seen. Today, when I was when I was skimming over it, I also found it interesting that the Eleatic philosopher talks about the words being used as a net to capture the meaning, which of course immediately reminded me of Zhuangzi. For the Eleatic philosopher and for Zhuangzi, the words are trapping the meaning, but the meaning itself is distinct from the words. The goal was always to illuminate some aspect of what is, to help you perceive it against its surroundings. Says my immediate reaction to what those commentators said about this aspect of the dialogue. They call the method arbitrary, silly, whatever, but I think it's actually appropriate. For if you like Eleatic philosophy, you know everything is. And in that context, there is distinction. And we use certain distinctions to lead everyone to what we have found. We, we can do it just like this Eleatic philosopher has done. Everything exists. Here are the lines of distinction. Let's kind of whittle away, not in a literal sense, because obviously it's still there, but sort of highlight this region of being and highlight these distinctions so that you can grasp what we have grasped. The next and final thing I wanted to speak about was the ontological section of the dialogue, specifically how to handle negation. For being is omnipresent. So how can it be negated or otherwise escaped? The simple answer is that any attempt to do so will fail. For, as Plato observes, if you reference something by saying it is nothing, you're actually affirming things about it. You're affirming that it is singular. Or if you say there are nothing, or they are nothing, then you are affirming that they are plural. At any rate, no matter how you speak of things, you're necessarily making an affirmation. I mean, for me, I don't even get into the singular or plural. I just say you're, you're referencing something. You, there is a something. There's some sort of affirmative ontological weight here. So then how do we say that something is not? Obviously, in a dialogue about the sophists, we want to say that something is not true or is false. Yet, obviously, it cannot be a nothing, for we are speaking about a claim. It is singular or plural. It has some internal meaning and so on. So we come to the general solution, which is brought about by distinction. We can interpret the term is not as other than. So if we say an apple is not an orange, we are saying that one is other than the other. An affirmation at all points. There is an apple. There is this notion of an orange. It all is. And there is this distinction between them, or these distinctions, plural, however we're defining these things. If the sophist is not providing an accurate account, then his account is presumably other than the thing, other than the truth, or other than an accurate account of what it is being described. So then what do we mean by the truth, and how do we classify falsehood? It's here that Plato works his deception as a fan fiction author. He has the Eleatic philosopher declare that we must refute Parmenides and go down some incoherent path of Platonic nonsense, which is where my second objection to the commentaries pops up. They think Plato has somehow achieved some masterful move here, when really he has done nothing more than assign his own foolishness to a philosophical school that could have saved him from error. He's brought in this Eleatic philosopher as a character And then he's had the Eleatic philosopher turn around and say, oh, we must refute Parmenides. We must go down this platonic road to gibberish and nonsense. For yes, in in one way of speaking, yes, being is truth, where truth is defined as what is. 
So all is true without exception because literally everything is. Yet we also have this second use of the term true that is opposed by falsehood. And it is this second definition we are using to describe the sophist's incorrect account of things. His account is false, not because it doesn't exist, that's senseless, it's gibberish. It's false because it does not accord. The sophist is presenting an affirmative description. It is something. But it is other than an accurate account or depiction of what the sophist is talking about. There needs to be a certain matching relationship. It's like two halves of a tally, but the sophist is bringing an incorrect piece. Of course, in the dialogue, the Eleatic philosopher is unsatisfied by this approach. Plato has him reject omnipresent being, or at least not even really talk about it. This is where he is no longer the Eleatic philosopher. He's, he's left that, and he's gone and become Plato's puppet, basically parroting what Plato wants him to say, these misteachings about being. The Eleatic philosopher is made to complain that we, and I quote from my translation, agree, not mine, but the, the text I was reading off this morning and I got in front of me earlier today, agree unwillingly that that which is not in a way is. For some reason, the Eleatic philosopher says that we are agreeing unwillingly, but actually we should absolutely agree with that. Wholeheartedly, that's the path of truth. Everything exists. And if we're saying that what the sophist says is not or is not the truth, it is in some sense. I mean, we're affirming that he, the sophist has said something and has a position, and that necessarily has some sort of affirmative ontological weight. It's just a matter of how we're going to describe it and piece together this model. Everything is. The difficulty is in accurately describing what is, describing all of its aspects. For what is goes beyond just a list of things. It also includes all the multitude of relations in the overall context and structure of reality. It is whole, complete, and perfect. And everything is included, even the sophist's lies. So we're not agreeing unwillingly that what the sophist has put forward exists. We wholeheartedly agree that what the sophist has put forward exists. And now we are identifying it as untrue or false because it doesn't accord with what he's trying to relate it to. The, he's misdescribing something, or it's just distinct, it's different in some way that an accurate account would not be, or that the accurate account would be other than, it would be accurate. But anyway, Plato goes down the road of discussing opposites and tries to reduce being to a third thing that is truly separate and somehow above two opposites. And ultimately he goes so far astray that he posits a being and a non-being and he signs the truth to being and the multitude of lies to the non-being and makes a dog's breakfast of the whole thing. It's just, it's a mess. Actually, you see this same mistake from Thomists and others online. It is a very frequent error and is a result of forgetting that being is omnipresent and ignoring the fact that at every stage we say is. So you take the opposite of hot and cold, right? Hot is, cold is. How about these two? Being is, non-being is. All we have done is stepped away from the original broader position, which is omnipresent being that subsumes all things. Just like a painting can subsume all of the images depicted within, all the materials used to constitute it. And now instead we've redefined being and we treat it as a category placed alongside other categories like non-being. But yet we're saying being is this, non-being is that. This is how they're distinct. Is at every point, affirmation at every point. We've simply gone from the omnipresent being, ignored that, gone down a level, and now we've redefined being as a category, one among many. It's complete nonsense. It's an ignorance of the original point, the broader point. And the result of forgetting that broader point and making these categories is just devastating to everything else one has to say about metaphysics and really all the important parts of philosophy in general. Because all the categories, if we want to categorize things as being, and this is non-being, and this is that, and this is the other, all categories are unified. They all have ontological presence, and we are referencing them all and comparing them. 
being and non-being are being compared in common. They're being affirmed in common. Because being, in the broader sense, is omnipresent and subsumes all these little categories that we've carved out. Being in the Eleatic sense, ontological presence or weight. And so Plato has done nothing more brilliant than to cook up a second definition for being, reducing it to one category among many, and in turn corrupting his thought and leading everyone astray, which is sadly a common error that infects many schools of thought that are still bouncing around today. I, I could harp on about other problems with the dialogue, like interpreting the analogy of the sphere, of the sphere as a literal description, but what of it? Most of what Plato has to say is a result of himself trying to pursue a second path. And I am referencing Parmenides' poem there. The result is that his teachings devolve into chaotic gibberish. If some Platonist wants to go over his failed critique of Parmenides, I'm happy to do so with them. Um, but for today, I just had the urge to make a simple video that explained what I took from this dialogue uh, because I was unsatisfied with what other online commentators have said rather than because I wanted to refute line by line Plato's misteachings or go line by line through this dialogue. But at any rate, I should um, be a little more positive. And I'll say I value this dialogue because it gives a 4th century account of how an Eleatic philosopher might set out to define something, which in turn gives some valuable information about Eleatic metaphysics and helps us reject the dumb idea that they thought reality was an illusion or whatever other dualist meme you hear. I also value it because, at least initially, it points out that negation is rather an affirmation, an affirmation of distinction or otherness, but at all times affirmed, for to paraphrase Melissus, if there are many, then they ought to be the same way as the one is, which I take to mean that all things conform to the requirements of being. And finally, I appreciate the dialogue because it's part of my own philosophical journey. I wasn't really thinking about Eleatic philosophy or ontology in 2010, so when I read The Sophist for the first time, I, it really did stand out to me, and I never really let go of that initial part about is not being an affirmation of distinction or otherness. I should also offer an olive branch to Platonists and admit that I do enjoy reading Plato now and again, uh, and there are times that I find him informative or agreeable on other topics. Uh, certainly, I don't want to say that Plato's worthless or anything. <laughs> but uh, there you have it. Uh, that's my immediate takeaways from the sophist and uh, maybe how I differ from the way other people have commented on it in, on YouTube and elsewhere.